good afternoon to all it's my pl pleasure to in, in, uh, introduce dr tan professor tan received his uh, b honor in electrical engineering from university of melbourne in 1992 and phd in material engineering from australian national university in 1997 he has been past recipient of the austrian research council poster doctor and future fellowship he has published or co-published over 450 journal papers and six book chapters he is also a co-inventor in four us patent related to laser diodes and infrared photo detectors his research interest includes epitaxial growth of low dimensional compound semiconductors nanostructure optoelectronics devices and unimplanted processing of compound semiconductors for optoelectronics device application with this short introduction i hand over in the section to dr ho tang thank you very much let me share my screen So can everyone see? Not yet. Okay. Make, make it in full screen. Yep, I will do that. Just a minute. How is that? Yeah. It's, it's all good. Okay. So can everyone hear me? Uh, yes, okay, th yes, thank you very you, much you, you for the uh, introduction uh, and also thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to give this uh, presentation of what we do at the Australian National University in Australia. And what I'm going to talk about today is the work that we are doing on semiconductor nanostructures such as nanowire and primarily for optoelectronics and energy application. So before I start, there's a lot of people I have to acknowledge. Uh, these are some of my group members right now. Uh, the red one are former past members and also some of our collaborators in green. And I also acknowledge our ANFF, the Australian National Fabrication <laughs> Facility staff. Those are the people who maintain our fabrication lab that allow us uh, to make the devices that I will talk to you of, uh, in the next 30 minutes. So the outline of my talk will be like this. So why are we interested in nanowires? Okay. How do we produce nanowires? So basically there are three ways we can produce nanowires, uh, vapor liquid solid growth uh, technique. And I'll give you an example uh, with the nanowire lasers. And the second way to produce uh, nanowires is by the selective area growth technique. And I'll give you an example of the nanowire solar cells. And then finally, there's also a top-down approach uh, that we use to make photoelectrodes for water splitting. Okay, and then after that, I'll talk about uh, our new research direction in shapes engineering. So instead of just nanowire in one dimension, we are going to uh, other dimensions as well. And I'll show you examples of micro ring lasers and new device architectures. And then finally, if I have time, I'll briefly talk to you about uh, the work we are doing growing hexagonal boron nitride over a wafer scale. So HBM is a 2D material. And we are interested in this for single photon sources, uh, using an passivation layer and template for van der Waals epitaxy. So why are we interested in nanowires? So as you can see here, this is the SEM image of nanowires. And you can see the nanowires has got very large surface area to volume ratio. So why is that important? You can think about, you know, for example, you want to make sensors because of the large surface area, it will be a very sensitive sensor. Or if you want to make them as an optoelectronic device like a photo detector or solar cell, then you have a lot of area for light absorption. Secondly, as you can see here, so uh, at the bottom here, you can see a dark uh, wafer and at the top, you can see a grayish wafer. So the bottom one is a nanowire grown on a wafer. And as you can see, it looks dark and black in color, okay? Which means it has these anti-reflective properties. So as you're gonna use it for solar cells, you don't have to put any layer of anti-reflective coating. So just naturally, it will absorb a lot of sunlight. And thirdly, nanowire, as I've shown here, it acts as a, like an antenna effect, okay? So what we mean here is that, you know, if you look at the nanowire, it has a certain cross-section, but because of this wave-guiding antenna effect, then it can absorb, actually, 
light from a larger area than the cross section. Okay, so if effectively it increase the absorption cross section of the nanowire, so you can absorb more light. And finally, as I shown here, this is an optical image. You can see our nano wires here. What I'm going to do now, I'll play a movie. We are exciting this nano wire uh, with a laser in the middle, and you can see light coming up from the edges or from the ends of the nano wire. So it naturally forms an optical cavity, and this is what we are interested in making nano wire lasers. So how do we grow this nano wire? So the first growth is the uh, technique is the vapor liquid solid growth mechanism. And this is not a new technique. It's been uh, demonstrated uh, by these two gentlemen uh, or more than 50 years ago here, you can see. And at the time they were playing with silicon, they're growing silicon and they use gold particle. So the way this works is they have a silicon wafer and then they put a gold particle, okay? At the time they are not talking about nano, you know, you can see the scale here, they are microns or even millimeter scale. So what they have is a silicon wafer, a gold particle, they heat this up and pass the silicon vapor in the form of silane. And if you look at this plot here, this is the temperature of versus uh, gold and silicon composition. So this is essentially the phase diagram. So if you're working at an elevated temperature here, for example, okay, and then you're passing the silane vapor, the silicon vapor. So the gold, this is 100% gold, 100% silicon. So the gold is gradually absorbing the silicon atoms. So it moves along this line until it hits this point here where it forms a eutectic, it forms a liquid, okay? So eutectic, this is a gold uh, silicon eutectic, and because it becomes a liquid, it wets the surface of the silicon wafer, okay? And then what happens is, you know, it keeps absorbing the silicon, it keeps moving along this line until it hits this point here where it forms into a liquid and a solid combination. So the silicon uh, solid will precipitate out as shown here and keep continuing to grow because you are continuing to pass the silicon vapor, okay? So you end up with these silicon wires, okay? So this is uh, so-called the vapor liquid solid growth mechanism or VLS in short, because we have the vapor, we have the liquid, and then we have the solid that grows up. So this is one way of growing nano wire. And this was like more than 40 years ago, but right, or 50 years ago right now, we can also do the same thing for uh, other semiconductors like gallium arsenide, three, five semiconductors. So before I show you uh, an example of our application here, so we want to grow these gallium arsenide nanowires to make nanowire lasers, okay? But before we do that, what we need to think about is the, in the VLS growth mechanism, the diameter of the nanowire is essentially de determined by the diameter of the gold particle that you use, okay? So we can get these nanoparticle these days very easily. You know, you can buy them off the shelf. Uh, you can buy them in all sorts of shapes, oh, sorry, all sorts of sizes, ranging from about 10 nanometers all the way to a few hundred nanometers, okay? So, but before we make some lasers with these nanowires, we need to think about what is the optimum diameter, okay? So what we've done is we've calculated the effective refractive index as a function of diameter. So obviously you want to have some, uh, effective refractive index because you want to have a waveguide, an optical cavity, okay? So if you look at this, if you go to very small diameter nanowires, you don't have any refractive index contrast with respect to air, okay? So you will not form an optical uh, cavity. So to really to form an optical cavity, you need to go to larger diameter nanowire, and you can see now we have some refractive index contrast, okay? And this can happen depending on the mode that you are interested in, okay? And similarly, when you are making a laser, we want to have the lowest threshold gain because we want to pump the, the nanowire. We don't want to pump it too hard that it burns before it starts to laser. So we want to have the lowest threshold. And if you look at the calculation that we've done here, the lowest threshold again occurs for the larger diameter nanowire, okay? So that is very easy to do, okay? So what we have to do now is just get the appropriate uh, gold particle of the right size and then we can grow this gallium arsenide nanowire. And that's what we did. So we use a larger diameter gold particle, and then we grow this gallium arsenide nanowire. As you can see here, this is a cross section. But what we also do is we cover the nanowire, the gallium arsenide nanowire with an aluminum gallium arsenide shell. So the reason for that is aluminum gallium arsenide has got a larger band gap. So it's essentially uh, uh, encapsulate the carriers in the, in the core region. And in addition to that, it also passivates the surface of gallium arsenide. So one of the 
critical issue in gallium arsenide is the surface has got very high surface recombination velocity, a lot, essentially a lot of surface states. So if you don't passivate the surface states, they act as non-radiative recombination center, which will essentially reduce the lasing efficiency of your nanowire. So we clap this gallium arsenide core with an aluminum gallium arsenide shell. Okay? And after that, we just, pass, uh, we just protect the aluminum gallium arsenide with another thin layer of gallium arsenide. And the reason for that is aluminum gallium arsenide oxidizes very easily in air. Okay? So if you don't protect it, it will oxidize. So after we've done that, you can see the diameter of the nanowire is effectively 400 nanometers. And then we knock it down uh, on a quad substrate and excite it with a pulse laser and then measure the output from this nanowire. So plotted here is a spectral uh, data from the nanowire as a function of excitation power. Okay, you can see here. And as at very low excitation power, you can see just a very broad emission, just like an LED action. As you increase the excitation power, one of the modes starts to dominate, and this mode becomes stronger and stronger as you increase the excitation higher and higher. And as you can see here on this plot, so the output uh, light versus pump power, you can see this, X, this has got a kink-like behavior. So a classic sign the device is lazy. Another indication that the device is lazing, if you look at the full wave half maximum of the spectrum, it increases uh, with excitation power until it hits a threshold and then it drops suddenly. Okay? So these are two proof that the nanowire is lazing. And yet another proof that our nanowire is lazing is from the optical image here. If you look from the top, the nanowire has just a glow before threshold and after threshold, it forms these interference fringes. And interference fringes is essentially occurring from the interference between the light coming out from the two end facets of the nanowire. And again, interference can only occur when the emissions are coherent, okay? And which means the nanowire is lazy. Okay, then I'll move on to another uh, growth technique, which is the selective area growth, okay? And selective area growth, this is shown here conceptually. What we start off is with a piece of substrate, for example, gallium arsenide or indium phosphide. And we cover that with a thin layer of dielectric, usually silicon dioxide. Okay, and then through this electron beam lithography technique, okay, we spin a, a layer of electron resist and use electron beam to pattern it. And then once we pattern that, we can etch into the silicon dioxide layer to form these holes. Okay, and then remove the electron resist layer and put this in our growth chamber and start to grow the nanowires. Okay, so now you see the nanowire diameter is essentially determined by the hole opening that you pattern, okay? And the beauty of this technique compared to the VLS growth is that you can grow very regular array, as you can see here, okay? So this is a 50 nanometer opening. You can see the nanowires are very regular. This is 100 nanometer and 250. And again, on a single wafer, you can create all the different diameter that you want. So this is a very powerful technique, uh, selective area growth. So before I show you an example of our device made by this selective area growth, uh, nanowire solar cell. So what we want to do is we want to see what is the optimum dimension for a nanowire solar cell, okay? So shown here is the absorption uh, intensity of the nanowire. This is a two micron uh, nanowire. And as you can see here, most of the absorption is in the top half, okay? So really, you don't need to grow very long nanowire. You'll be wasting your material. So you, know, you need to grow about two or three microns. That's more than enough to absorb all, essentially, all the sunlight that, that is uh, shine on the rim. And then the next thing, if you want to make a nanowire solar cell, what we did was we optimized the short circuit current density here, okay? And as a function of the nanowire diameter and the diameter divided by the pitch ratio, okay? The pitch is essentially the spacing between the nanowire. And as you can see here, this is the region we want to work with where you have the maximum short circuit current density. Again, in this region here, you can see the, the optimum nanowire diameter is about 180 nanometers and the diameter divided by the pitch is roughly about 0.6. And that's very easy to do, okay? We can just use our e beam lithography and pattern this according to the dimensions that we want. And then the height of the nanowire is just strictly determined by the growth time. So once we've grown our nanowires, as you can see here, we grow indium phosphide nanowire on a P plus substrate. So this is the intrinsic absorption layer. We have an N plus contact layer. So after we've grown this nanowire, what we need to do is we need to make 
electrical contacts. Okay, but electrical contacts is not so trivial. You know, a lot of semiconductor tools are designed for planar structure, so we need to develop this fabrication process. And as you can see here, what we need, what we did was we planarize the nanowire array with some polymer like BCD. So obviously, when we planarize it, you know, it covers the entire nanowire. And then we need to etch down the BCD such that only the top contact layer is exposed. Okay. And then once that's done, we deposit a transparent contact like indium tin oxide, and then put another contact on the top and a contact at the bottom. And you can see here, these are different stages of the fabrication process here. Okay. So after that, we did our uh, measurement for the nanowire solar cell. As you can see here, we got some photovoltaic uh, action. So this is not great. You can see the efficiency is only just under 10%. You know, in three, five nanowires typically have very high efficiency, but this is nothing to be proud of. One of the problem we found out is that, you see, when we planarize it and start to etch it down, not all the nanowires are exposed. You see some of the parts here don't expose. If they don't expose, you cannot make contact. And if you cannot make contact, then you get no photo current, okay? So one of the problem is uniformity uh, in terms of processing and also some local variation. When we grow the nanowire, some are taller, some are shorter. So, you know, the efficiency is not great. Okay? So, but one, once we know the problem, we can use uh, other ways to do it. So you, you can see we have in, improved our growth such that we have the nanowire, which are fairly uniform in length. And then in our fabrication process, we develop a new fabrication procedure where we conformally coat it with a, a zinc oxide layer. Zinc oxide acts as an electron selective contact, as shown here. And then again, conformally cover it with uh, another contact layer like aluminum zinc oxide. Okay? So by doing all this, improve on the optimization uh, fabrication process, you can see we can significantly enhance the efficiency of our nanowire uh, solar cell to in excess of 16%. Okay? And this is the quantum efficiency uh, measurement. It shows you it's fairly efficient, uh, close to about 90%, the external quantum efficiency for a broad spectral range for, from the indium phosphide nanowire. During the optimization of the fabrication process, you know, we, as I mentioned before, we uh, planarize it with some uh, polymer such as BCB. We found that you know, once we planarize, we, we can actually peel off the whole BCB layer with the nanowire intact into the BCB layer. Okay? And similarly, we can do the same with PDMS. Okay? Uh, and what this shows us is that you know, it gives us now an, an opportunity to make flexible nanowire solar cells. Okay? So for example, if you can make top contact and then you can make bottom contact, then potentially you can have uh, what we call these flexible nanowire solar cells. So as the theme of this conference is on flexible uh, devices, we are also developing uh, a couple of other uh, flexible or fabrication technique to, to make flexible device. So shown here is one of the technique we are developing called spalling. Okay, the concept of spalling is demonstrated here. So you have your substrate, okay, and you put a, a stressor layer on top. Typically, this is a, a layer of film, a metal film around a micron or a few microns thick, okay. So because of the stress that is created by this uh, metal layer, okay, it bend up the, 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 the substrate and create a crack. Okay? So you can peel off gently along the crack. Okay? And because this substrate is usually crystalline material, the crack can propagate along certain crystallographic orientation. Okay? And once you've done that, you can leave off the whole uh, layer that you want. So this is a very interesting technique that you can exfoliate layers from the wafer. And in fact, you can do this multiple times. Okay? Once you've done this, you can deposit another stressor layer on top of this so you can reuse the substrate. Okay? And in fact, we've demonstrated we can do this about 10 times before the material quality drops. So this is a simple and cosmetic process. And it is applicable to all sorts of brittle material, but more importantly, it must be a crystalline material. Otherwise, you cannot control the crack propagation. And shown here, see we spall off a, a thin indium phosphide uh, layer, which is a, a wafer scale. This is about two centimeters. But since then, we, we've got something a bit bigger now. So another uh, flexible uh, fabrication technique or flexible device fabrication technique that we have we are developing is this epitaxial lift-off layer. Okay, shown here is the schematic of how this uh, the 
this, this works. So you start off your, your substrate and then during the layer growth, we grow a sacrificial layer and then grow your device layer on top of this sacrificial layer. Okay? So the important part of this sacrificial layer is must be selectively etched in some particular etching and the device layer is not etched by uh, the etching. Okay? So this must be selectivity between the sacrificial layer and the device layer. And you put the whole thing in uh, some etching, usually some kind of acidic solution. And then it will gradually etch this sacrificial layer and then the whole device layer is peeled off. And this is probably not very clear, but I'll guide you through it. You can see here, we have a gallium arsenide film, okay? And we planarize it with some SU8. And you can see here, this is actually nano wire that we've grown on the gallium arsenide substrate, okay? With a sacrificial layer. You can see here, there's a nano wire, which is sort of an, at an angle. So this is a schematic that shows that. So the substrate is just underneath it with a sacrificial layer in between, okay? So, and after we etch this sacrificial layer, you can see this film with the nano wire still attached. And we can lift it off to, not, not very big, but at this stage, we can lift off about a centimeter by a centimeter. So now we're in the process of making this uh, scaling up to larger areas. Okay, so uh, we keep going. Uh, I want to show you another way that we can make these nano wires. The, the last two techniques I show you are from the bottom up approach. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether it's VLS or selective area growth, they are from the bottom up approach. Another way to make this is from the top down approach. And the top down approach is something that looks like this. So we have a three, five semiconductor layer. Okay, we first of all deposit a, a layer of silicon dioxide and then deposit a very thin layer of nickel, okay? So because the layer is very thin, when we anneal it, so what happens is be wet from the silicon dioxide surface and form these part nanoparticles, okay? So once it forms these nanoparticles, we etch away the oxide layer. So you end up with a nickel and an, and an oxide uh, mass, essentially, okay? And we use this mass uh, to protect the underlying material and then we etch it uh, by a plasma technique. And after that, once you've reached the right depth that you want to etch or the length of the nano wire you want to etch, then we remove this uh, silicon dioxide nickel mask and then you end up with these uh, nano wires. So one of the problem with this technique is that you, you cannot control the size very accurately. So there's always a statistical variation, a stochastic variation to it. But you can see we, we have a little bit of uh, control in the sense that you see, if you deposit a thin layer of nickel compared to a thick layer, we can control the average size of the diameter of the nano wire. Okay? But the beauty of this technique is you can go to very large area. Okay? Remember I was showing you a VLS and, and the selective area growth, they are usually limited to small area, but with this one, you can go to large area with, with a scale essentially. Okay, so we want to use this, uh, uh, nano wires as a photo electrode, but just quickly, I'll run through you how this photo electrode works. Essentially, uh, we use this for electro photo electrochemical water splitting. So we want to create uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, from water uh, just with sunlight as a source, okay? So usually this is done in a, in a cell that looks like that. We have our semiconductor, okay? And it doesn't matter whether it's a photo anode or cat photo cathode, depending on whether it's an N-type or P-type material. And on the other side, we have a counter electrode, usually platinum, and we immerse these two electrodes in an electrolyte solution, okay? And connect these uh, two electrodes with an external bias and shine light onto the semiconductor, okay? So now over here, I've plotted the band structure of this particular system. So let's assume this semiconductor is an n-type material, so we make it a photo anode. So this is the solution here. This is a semiconductor band diagram, and this is the counter electrode, which is the platinum metal. Okay, and the external bias. So because the semiconductor is in contact with the electrolyte, it has this band bending. And because it's N-type, it bends like this. And then now you shine uh, light onto this, it creates this electron hole pairs. And because of the band bending, the electrons is swept away into the external circuit by this external bias into the counter electrode to induce this hydrogen evolution reaction to occur. Okay. And similarly, on the other side, the holes is swept into the electrolyte to induce this oxygen evolution reaction to occur, okay? So I'll show you our results here. So we are using this uh, gallium nitride uh, 
to make the nanowires. So again, we grow the gallium nitride layer and use this, uh, uh, the nickel and the silicon dioxide mass technique to make this nanowire. Okay, so just focus on this one first. So we have the bare nanowire. If you look at this plot, this is the photo current density as a function of bias. If you look at the black curve, okay, so we do see some onset of the photo current when you shine light onto, onto this photoelectrode. Okay, so this is the bare gallium nitride. But typically in this photoelectrochemical experiment, we also deposit some co catalysts. Okay, and one of the reasons for co catalysts is, you know, from a physics point of view, it's very easy to conceptualize that holes can be swept into the elect uh, electrolyte. Okay, but you know, chemically, it's not so easy. So normally, what people do is incorporate some co catalysts okay, on the electrode, on the surface of electrode, which is in contact with the electrolyte to assist with the carrier transport. So you can see here, we deposit uh, cobalt oxide nanoparticles, 5S means five seconds of deposition. And if you look at the red curve here, so by putting some cobalt oxide, you can see the photo current is enhanced. Okay. And in addition to that, you can see the onset potential now is reduced. Okay, which means the external bias that we apply to this system, we can reduce the, the applied potential. Okay? So, but if you deposit too much cobalt oxide, for example, 10 seconds or 15 seconds, then it starts to cover up some of the gallium nitride nanowire and it blocks out some of the sunlight. Okay? So that's why the photocurrent drops again. But if you look at this plot here, which is more important, you can see the black curve, which is the bare gallium nitride, you can see the degradation Okay, the photocurrent degradation with time. Okay, which means what happens is the electrolyte is etching the nanowire. Okay, so the photocurrent starts to drop. But if you passivate it with some cobalt oxide, then you can see that uh, not only it enhances the photocurrent, but the stability is significantly enhanced. So now you can essentially we have a longer lifetime photoelectrode compared to the one without any uh, cobalt oxide nickel. So this is uh, the gallium nitride nanowire for photo anode. So in this case, we produce uh, oxygen on the electrode. And if we use uh, indium phosphide, we can make a photo cathode. This is where we produce hydrogen from the indium phosphide nanowire. So again, we do the same thing, uh, the top-down approach. But one of the problem with indium phosphide is indium phosphide is a much softer material compared to gallium nitride. Okay, so you can see after the plasma etching, we create, create a lot of surface damage. So what we need to do is clean up this surface damage. And the way we clean it up is by dipping this nanowire in a solution, which is essentially sulfur which dissolved in an oleamine solution. Okay? And if we treat it for about an hour to an hour and a half, so after that, you can see the surface is properly cleaned up without any surface damage. So in addition to that, what we, do, we did was we did um, the measurement. You can see this is the photoluminescence coming out from the nanowire. After the sulfur and oleamine treatment, you can see this luminescence is significantly enhanced, which means the quality now has improved. And we also did time resolved measurement. You can see after the oleamine treatment, the lifetime is significantly longer. Again, all these points will improve in the quality of the material. And when we do the photoelectrochemical experiment, you can see here the photocurrent. Now this is negative because this is a photocathode. You can see now with the sulfur and oleamine treatment, the photocurrent is significantly enhanced compared to the one without the treatment. Okay. And if you look also at the lifetime, the lifetime after the sulfur oleamine treatment is significantly longer than uh, the one without, not treated. Okay, so not only sulfur oleamine is able to what you call uh, remove the damage, but it also passivate the surface so that it enhances the, the lifetime of the photoelectrode. Okay, uh, let's move on. So now I'll show you uh, the next area of research that we are working on. And this is called shape engineering by selective area epitaxy. So just now I'll show you, we grow uh, this nanowire by selective area growth. Remember we use E-beam lithography to open up the holes, okay? And then we grow nanowire. But E-beam lithography is such a powerful technique. We don't have to open up holes. We can draw lines, we can draw circles, we can draw all sorts of shape, okay? And this is where we exploit uh, uh, this technique. So now I start off with my wafer. So over here, okay? I've shown you before, we open up holes to grow the nanowire. But what happens now if I draw a line, okay? And if I draw a line, a line along certain crystallographic orientation, what will happen, okay? So shown here is an example. This is an indium phosphide a nano white, a nanomembrane. So now if I align my openings along the one, one zero direction, 
okay, on the indium phosphide substrate, and we grow, you can see we form this nanomembrane, okay, which has a very thin side wall, and the length of the membrane is just defined by the length of the opening that you have, and then the height is essentially determined by the time, okay, so we get a very thin membrane. If we align it in the 112 direction here, okay, so now it also forms this nanomembrane, but you can see it's much fatter. And the reason for that is because the surface here is 110. So the side facet is 110, whereas in this case, the side facet is 111. Okay, basically the growth on the 112 surface is much slower than the growth on the 110. That's why you end up like a self-limited growth. We have a very thin membrane. What happens now, we align this line somewhere in between these two orientation, okay? So as you can see here now, it forms more like a, a pyramidal uh, prism kind of structure. Okay, and this facet now is bonded by a combination of those two facets. Okay, so that is very interesting. As I shown you, whether you align it along 110, 112 for indium phosphide, you get uh, essentially nano membranes, right? But it just the, the width is slightly different. But if you do the same thing for a different semiconductor, for example, indium arsenide, then if you align it to the 110 direction, instead of forming a membrane, you form this uh, more like a nano prism, okay? And if you align it into a 112 direction, it forms a very narrow, much significantly much narrower than these two. Okay. So again, this depends on two things. One is the geometrical confinement. And the other thing is the surface energy. As I mentioned before, the fact that this width here is narrower because the, fast, uh, the, the, the side facet is a 112. Whereas in this case, the side facet is a 110. So different facets has different surface energy. So by exploiting the geometrical uh, orientation and the surface energy of different crystal facets, we should be able to control the shape that we want to do, to grow. And this is an example. So now we can grow, a, a, we pattern a, a structure with a ring, an annular ring, and we can grow this micro ring structure. Okay, so this is Indian phosphide micro ring grown on Indian phosphide. So our plan is to make a micro ring cavity laser from this uh, particular nanostructure. And this is so shown here, this is a cathaluminescence. So uh, this is not lasing yet, but uh, we are still working on it to improve the, what they call in, essentially the optical cavity, uh, the quality factor of the, of the ring. And furthermore, this is grown indium phosphide on indium phosphide. So we don't have a good uh, refractive index contrast. So if you can grow this on some other material, for example, silicon, then the refractive index contrast will change. So hopefully we can get a stronger Q factor and hopefully the device will be laden. So these are sort of the directions we are currently working on away from just the nano wire. And just to show that, you know, just by patterning, you know, dif different uh, geometry and different shapes, you can grow all sorts of, of uh, different nano structures. And of course, you know, if I have uh, 30 students, I can put one student on each of the different shapes that I want, but obviously I don't have that. And what we are focusing now essentially is just on the nano, uh, sorry, micro ring and the nano membrane. How, how much time do I have? Yeah, so yeah, your time end at uh, 1.35. So you have- Okay, to... so I have a few minutes, just very quickly. I was just want to run through uh, with you uh, the growth of this hexagonal, hexagonal boron nitride on a large wafer scale, okay? So HBN is a 2D material. So some of the application are shown here is uh, it's got a large band gap. So people are interested in using this uh, for deep UV emission, uh, for example, deep UV LED. And those who are working on 2D material know 2D, uh, uh, what you call HBN is a passivation layer. If you want to make a transistor and they've shown that if you have a, uh, get a HBN on top and a HBN on the bottom, it improves the performance of the transistor, okay? And another thing that 2D layer can be used for is this so-called van der Waals epitaxy, where we grow the device structure that we want on this 2D material. And because of the van der Waals bonding, we can actually peel this off very easily, okay? And finally, which is just been shown uh, only in the last few years, that defects in hexagonal boron nitride gives you also this uh, single photon emission, which are interesting for people who are working on uh, quantum computing and quantum uh, secure communication. So the way we grow this, uh, okay, before I start, H HBN is already there. Uh, you can buy them off the shelf. Unfortunately, they come in very small size, typically a few millimeters in size. And then, you know, in 2D material, typ typically people peel it off with like a scotch tape. So, you know, if you peel it off, you're lucky to be able to get, say, 
a few hundred microns by a few hundred microns. Okay, so despite of this, you know, people are talking about oh, we can you know make the next generation quantum computers and all that. But you know, really, you want to scale this up. Okay, people are not going to in the manufacturing. We are not going to use scotch tape to peel up device by device. So because we have this uh, MOCD growth chamber, so we decided to see whether we can grow hexagonal boron nitride on the wafer scale. And the way we do it is by using uh, ammonia, which is the nitrogen source, and another uh, source, which is the triethyl boron as the boron source, okay? So we introduce in the growth chamber, and this gallium nitride, uh, sorry, boron nitride needs a very high growth temperature. So we typically grow this at about 1300 degrees Celsius, okay? So as you can see here, five minutes growth, uh, AFM image, one hour, four hour, eight hour. So we did the Raman measurement. As you can see, we do have uh, layers of hexagonal boron nitride. And this intensity increases as the layer gets thicker and thicker. But what we found is if you grow it for too long a time, you can see these white speckles on top. Okay? Essentially, these are debris that drops onto the surface of the hexagonal boron nitride. So what happens actually when we're doing this is because this is grown at very high temperature, when we introduce these two precursor, they actually react in the gas phase, okay? They form these hexagonal boron nitride nanoparticles and start dropping on the surface, okay? So not only growth is occurring on the surface, but growth is also occurring in the gas phase as nanoparticle and they start to drop, okay? So this is actually not very good for us. We want to get rid of this uh, surface uh, debris, we call it. So the way we go about uh, getting rid of this surface debris is instead of introducing the two sources at the same time, we do a pulse growth. So we introduce them sequentially, boron, nitrogen, boron, nitrogen, or ammonia, and so on. Okay. So by doing that now, you can see we can get rid of all this debris. Okay. So I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can see probably there's like domains here. Okay. So these are not crystal domains. They are actually wrinkles. Okay. So what happens is we grow this hexagonal bond nitride on sapphire substrate, which grows fine. But the problem happens when we start to cool down and take it out from the growth chamber. And because of the mismatch, in the left uh, thermal expansion coefficient between HBN and sapphire. So what happens is the film starts to wrinkle. Okay, And this wrinkle, they are not actually cracked, they are wrinkled. As you can see here, this is the TEM image. So you can see here, this is a sapphire substrate. And you can see this layer by layer growth of the hexagonal bond nitride, which is a 2D material. And we are lucky to be able to see one of the uh, region here at the wrinkle region. You can see here, you see the film do not crack. Okay, so they just wrinkle. Okay, it's still a continuous film, but it's just wrinkle. And we can actually get rid of this wrinkle. If we can lift off the hexagonal bond nitride, then the wrinkle sort of irons out, okay, without any crack in the film. So as you can see here, we can transfer uh, this uh, centimeter scale hexagonal bond nitride. So we can transfer it on a, a piece of silicon on SiO2. So you can see that. And we also use this as a passivation layer uh, as for, for, for our study. And what we did is we use this to demonstrate the passivation, passivation property in SERS application. For example, here you have silver nanoparticles as uh, for SERS application. So as you know, uh, uh, silver is a good plasmonic material. It can enhance the sensitivity of, the, of Raman signal, okay? So, but the problem is gold, uh, with silver is it oxidizes very easily. So by putting a layer of HBN on top of this silver particle, okay? And even after annealing here at six, uh, I think this is 400 degrees Celsius. And this is the Raman signal from a rhodamine solution, okay? As you can see here, if you don't protect the silver uh, particles after annealing, the SIR signal is gone, okay? But if you protect this with hexagonal bond nitride, you can see the signal still remains even after 400 degrees annealing. So it's a very good passivation layer. And secondly, what we studied is, you can see here, these are two inch wafer of sapphire that we grow HBN on. So this is a, a very low flow of boron source, okay? As you increase the amount of boron flow, you can see the film becomes darker. Okay, so what we actually found out is that the dark, the, the color from this film actually comes from the impurity. And because triethyl boron has got a lot of carbon, so we identify that this coloration is due to the carbon impurities from the source. Okay, so if you measure the optical properties, you can see there's some emission coming out in the visible region. Okay, so as I mentioned before, HBN is people are interested because it's got a large band gap, give, it gives you a deep UV emission. But unfortunately, because of all these impurities, we don't see this UV emission. 
we see visible emission. So when we started with this project, we were a bit disappointed because we do not see any UV emission. But you know, sometimes you know, this, this thing sort of you know, occurs by accident. But what we have found is that we can correlate this visible emission with the amount of carbon incorporation. As you can see here, if you are using a lot of TED, then you have a lot of carbon incorporation. So this intensity increase. So essentially, this is like the defect or impurity emission that comes up from HPN. But what we also discovered in collaboration with some uh, colleagues from University of Technology in Sydney, and this impurity emission is actually not too bad. You know, if you look at here, this is a piece of hexanal bond nitride. Okay, so we map it out, and you can see these are very bright region here, and some of them are not so bright, and this is outside the HBN. So obviously, outside the HBN, you have no uh, emission. Okay. And some regions here, you can see just a very broad emission peak as I shown you here, this is a broad emission peak. But in some of the very bright spot, you can see in addition to this very broad peak, you see very, this very sharp emission, okay? So these are the quantum emission or the single photon emission. And if you do the uh, autocorrelation measurement here, you can see this is a proof that this is a single photon emission, okay? So now by controlling the, sorry, by controlling the amount of defects or carbon impurities inside, we can control the amount of single photon, uh, the density of single photon emission. Okay, so finally, this is my last slide. So I want to show you that we can also use this hexagonal bond nitride as a van der Waals template. So we grow uh, hexagonal bond nitride on sapphire substrate. And then after that, we can grow our layered structure. For example, here I've grown in aluminum nitride nano wires, and I can peel off you can see, in fact, this is already lifted off. All the aluminum nitride nanowires are already lifting off. Okay, so I can make a nanowire device which is flexible, or I can also coalesce this uh, aluminum nitride nanowire to form a, a, a film. Then I can grow other materials on top of that. Then I can peel off the whole structure and make device out of it. So uh, essentially, I have a, a flexible device structure. So these are sort of the directions we are working on now to make flexible devices. Okay, so I just want to end uh, with just a quick summary here. I won't uh, read it out. You can have a look uh, on the summary. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Uh, lot of participants have given a, a, a positive comment regarding your talk that I can tell you like that. Uh, this talk was very uh, useful and informative. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So I have a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is, uh, the one basic question is, and, uh, they are asking about uh, how we can differentiate nanowire solar cells with the nano rod solar cell. Nanowire and nano rods. Okay. So yeah. these are sort of interge the, the term terminology is interchangeable. So usually for nanowire, you know, gallium arsenide in lymphocyte, we can grow longer. So people normally call that nanowire. But for gallium nitride, usually, you know, you, people, they, they, they cannot grow that long. So typically they're limited to just one or two microns. So they call it nano rods. I suppose to some extent, it depends on the aspect ratio. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question. So if, if you are going to use the wide band semiconductor like titanium oxide, instead of sig oxide, whether it will increase the efficiency of indium phosphate nanowire cells? Solar cells, is it? Yeah. Yes, so as I showed before, uh, the absorption is still done by the 3 5 material. As you know, 3 5 material is a very good absorbing layer. You know, the highest efficiency solar cell is made of 3 5 materials, okay? So what, are, what we've done is, you know, sometimes in, the device, especially nanowire, is doping them. If you want to make a solar cell, you need to have a PN junction. Okay, so sometimes doping is not so uh, trivial in nanowires. Okay, so people are looking at ways where we can introduce this uh, carrier selective contact. Essentially, you have like a filter for holes and filter for electrons. Okay, so you don't need a PN junction anymore. If you create electron hole pairs in your three five layers, then you have a filter for electrons, filter for holes, and then you can selectively draw them out. Okay. And contribute to the photocurrent. And usually, these electron selective or hole selective layers are made of uh, ox metal oxide material. So, this should essentially, uh, I wouldn't say enhance efficiency compared to a PN junction, 
but it gives you the flexibility, still getting high efficiency, but without the complication of having to dope your structure, particularly in nano wire, which is not easy. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Tan. I'm handing out in section to Dr. Nirmala Grace. Uh, I think the session is over. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hotan, for uh, uh, you know thanks again for accepting our invitation to be a speaker. Uh, the interest, uh, presentation was really very interesting, and uh, the participants really uh, appreciated your talk. Thank you okay. once again. Uh, yeah. Thank you once again, Dr. Tan. Thank, thank you very much. All the best. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Dear participants, uh, we, we are going to stop this session now and we will join back exactly at 2 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>